Welcome, everyone, to this briefing brought to you by the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF. In Hebrew, our name is Abit Chonistim. IDSF is a leading Israeli organization advocating for strong national security to defend Israel. Thank you so much to all of our viewers, all of our supporters for tuning in to this briefing, previous briefings to allow us to really bring you behind the headlines what is happening here in this war in Israel. Uh, many people, when they think about IDSF, they think about these briefings, but it's of course important to understand that this is just a tiny little piece of who we are as an entity here in Israel. We work very hard to promote sensible policies, to promote victory and strength here in Israel. We work with policymakers across the world. We have a very large educational network here in Israel, and we are of course extensively present on the media, both here in Israel and abroad. And I thought today what we would do just to give a little bit more of an insight about who we are and what we do is to share with you a briefing uh, that we did um, earlier uh, for a delegation from Europe who came here to Israel and we provided them a half day a seminar, half day briefing to provide them an update of what is happening on the ground in Israel. And so it was a, a multi-hour event. Our briefing is only 30 minutes long. We can't share everything with you, but we took uh, General Avivi's presentation to, these, uh, to this delegation from Europe, and we're going to share it with you so that you can see uh, that we're not just talking uh, to our followers in the US, but we're actually really on the ground here uh, speaking to people who make a difference, who go back to their countries abroad uh, and bring our understanding of this war and the needs of Israel with them. So please bear with me a moment while I bring up this uh, video again of this briefing that we did for uh, a, a group from Europe who came here to Israel to really understand what is happening on the ground. Thank you very much, Eli. Thank you, everybody, for uh, making the time and uh, attending. Um, you know, I have uh, many, many briefings and uh, conventions around Israel these days, two or three a week in all cities, uh, really to empower the Israeli society, to explain what's going on. Everybody is worried. Everybody wants to know what will happen. And um, one of the things I say always at the end of uh, the briefing is, is an optimistic vision, saying that in this reality we are facing now, the bigger the victory will be, the more decisive it will be, the greater the golden age of Israel and the Jewish people will be the day after. The day after, I'm not talking about Gaza now, I'm talking about the bigger picture. The day after, there will be peace agreements in the Middle East, and the Israeli economy will boom. And there will be massive aliyah of Jews to Israel. And there will be like in any war, baby boom. But really, the message to the Israeli people is that in order to reach this point, we need to stay united and fight, and win decisively. Now, we are now in a very, very crucial moment where there are two, um, narratives that are being pushed. One narrative says, you know, I've been fighting for 10 months. We have achievements, good achievements in Gaza. They paid a heavy price for what they did. Okay, that's it. Let's stop. Let's try to get our hostages. Let's do a ceasefire in Gaza. And if we do a ceasefire in Gaza, there will be a ceasefire also in the north. And if there will be a ceasefire in the north, we'll be able to bring back our citizens. And if this is the case, maybe there will be even a peace agreement with the Saudi Arabia. And really people buy into this uh, narrative, but this narrative is completely false you know, for, for, the, for a very simple reason because it means Hamas stays in power. It means that when Israel retreats from Gaza, it will take Hamas maybe a year to go back 
to the 6th of October, to build up in a way that will endanger again all our towns in the south, to build again the rocket uh, capability. Now, as we speak, in the Sinai Peninsula, there is endless amount of weapons, explosives, and operatives waiting to go into Gaza. And we build Hamas. Hamas doesn't care how many terrorists are killed or how many citizens are displaced or what's the level of destruction of the houses. It only cares about surviving and rebuilding again. This is the strategy. And talking about the North, if we do a ceasefire um, and try to convince our citizens to go back home, um, many of them won't go back because they're saying we're not going to face the same danger our friends in the South faced, having Nukba on steroids in the form of Radwan forces uh, on our borders. And a ceasefire with uh, Hezbollah means basically um, that Hezbollah stays in full power, stays in South Lebanon, stays with all the rockets and capabilities they have. So we might bring back our citizens, maybe we'll have a few months of quiet, maybe a year, and then they'll shoot again. And what will we do? We'll tell them to get out of the, their houses again? And what will we say to our soldiers that are fighting now in Gaza to destroy Hamas if we stop and let Hamas rebuild itself again? So basically, this uh, way of thinking will bring Israel, uh, I think, to an existential threat. It will enable rebuilding back uh, Hamas. Hezbollah will stay strong. Our deterrence will be non-existent because if we cannot defeat our weakest enemy, Hamas, and if we um, don't destroy them after what they did, on the 7th of October, what does it say about us? Um, and therefore, the motivation to attack us, to uh, continue the aggression, will be high and, and will be again under the threat of endless amount of rockets and missiles and so on. So in IDSF, when we talk to the government, the army, we say, this is not an option. This is not a pass that we can go. We need to stick with victory. And um, victory means destroying completely Hamas as a governmental and military entity, exactly as the goals of war say. It means bringing back all our hostages, not part of them. It means creating the terms in Gaza that never again there will be a terror army in Gaza. And Israel, in this sense, can be dependent on anybody. We need to make sure that never again there will be a terror army in Gaza. Um, in the north, frankly, uh, without um, any credible military threat of a coalition on Iran or Hezbollah, without international pressure to impose Resolution 1701, um, I think that Israel has really no choice but to go to war. Um, and Israel hasn't set goals of war for the North. But if I have to set them, I will say that unlike Gaza, we cannot set a goal that says eradicating Hezbollah. Because Israel is not going to conquer off Lebanon. And even, even if we did, Hezbollah can withdraw into Syria. Um, but we can inflict very, very serious uh, damage on Hezbollah, all its capabilities, and we can push Hezbollah out of South Lebanon, creating the terms for bringing back our citizens safely home. In a reality where when they look north, they see the IDF, not Hezbollah, and for a very long time, until some kind of uh, resolution, solution uh, for really creating a reality where Hezbollah cannot go back south. And this might, I mean, this, this might take many, many years. Um, so I think that winning decisively against Hamas and hitting very, very hard Hezbollah and setting the terms for 
bringing our citizens back. Uh, this also creates the terms uh, needed or sets the ground also for dealing with Iran. And Iran is not Israel's private problem. Iran is a global threat. Iranian aspirations for nuclear weapons will endanger the whole globe. And they want to control all the strains. Bab el Mandab, Hormoz, Gibraltar, and under a, a nuclear umbrella, they will be able to coerce the whole globe to do what they want. So this is not an option. There cannot be nuclear, and this needs to be dealt with. But the right way to deal with this is a coalition. Israel can attack Iran. We might find ourselves doing it this week. Um, but overall, I think that there is a need for a coalition to, to deal with them. Um, I think that uh, we had, since the beginning of the war, we in IDSF had 10 meetings with the Prime Minister, every meeting two or three hours. And, and I think that he's very, very resolute. And when he says total victory, he means that. Maybe the word total victory is not a clear goal of war, but it's a mindset that says we are going all the way and we are going to reach what we want. So we have these clear goals of war in the south, and we need to set clear goals for the north and also Iran. Um, I think that um, right now, the moment we are now, uh, Iranians are preparing to shoot. I think they are taking a huge, huge risk of uh, bringing the whole Middle East to a regional, uh, full-scale regional war. Uh, we are not in April now. We are in a very, very, very different moment because in April it was obvious that we need to stay focused on Gaza. In April, we, we didn't go yet into Rafah. This was the main thing we needed to deal with. And um, so we in IDSF, of course, said, no matter what Iran does, we'll have to defend, maybe do something small, but we need to focus. We need to focus. We need to reach our goals in Gaza. This is the strategy we set 10 months ago. Offensive on Gaza, defense on all other fronts. But now it's not April. Now we're controlling uh, Philadelphia. We pretty much control all of Rafah. Um, and uh, in Khan Yunis, we have full freedom of operation. In most of the central camps, the same. In the north, the same. Um, the level of destruction of Hamas is very high. Just today, 45 terrorists were killed, just in the last 24 hours. So the level of effectiveness of the, the IDF is very, very high. Uh, and it's clear that in Gaza we are going to victory. Now, I, I met the Southern Command commander last week, uh, two hours talk, and I asked him, okay, how much time do you need? He said, I need two months. He said from the very beginning, on the 7th of October, he will need a year to reach the goals of war. He said, now it's 10 months, I need two months more. I said to him, okay, but if you don't have two months, if we need to take most of the divisions north now, he said, okay, I'll manage. So it won't take me two months, it will take me four months, five months, if I have less forces. So we reached the point where the IDF, the cabinet, can decide to leave less forces in Gaza and move the center of attention to the north. Will they do that? I don't know. Are they going to wait two months more? Maybe. But now it's not only dependent on Israel. Now we also have Hezbollah and Iran, and it's very, uh, we will be really affected by, why, but by what they want to do. So maybe even without wanting it, we're going to find ourselves in the coming week, months, uh, in a full-scale war in the north. Um, we always say that in war, you need to be proactive. You need to attack first. 
and this is what we expect uh, from the IDF, not to wait to be shot, but to attack. War is not a tennis match. It's not you hitting the ball and then it goes to the other side and you wait for your rival to hit it back, no. In war you hit all the time, you don't wait. And uh, the IDF is continuing its operations all the time. We sit in Lebanon, even in the last 24 hours. Uh, one of the commanders uh, of Red One Forces was targeted. So the IDF is continuing uh, the operations. But really this big question, what, what is the overall strategy? There is only one big question the cabinet needs to decide. Are we changing the basic strategy or not? Are we shifting to the north and going to offensive in the north, or are we continuing the same strategy, focusing on Gaza and waiting and being on the defense in the north? This is the one and only question, serious question that uh, the cabinet needs to, to answer, and I think this is what um, obviously they are discussing. We all agree that destroying Hamas is the most crucial thing. This war cannot end without Hamas being destroyed. But we also have other missions. We have 80,000 people displaced. Hezbollah started a war completely unprovoked. And um, we have to be back, bring back our citizens. And 80% of them are saying, if Hezbollah is on our borders, we're not coming back. And we don't have an option not to create the terms of bringing back uh, our citizens. So looking strategically, really, at all, all the arenas that we are dealing with, what is the day after? Um, I would say the day after is Hamas eradicated as a governmental and military entity. And when I say governmental, it means that even if it is for a certain period of time, Israel needs to replace them. I don't see, realistically speaking, any international body that will step in instead of Hezbollah. The Prime Minister talked in the Congress about radicalization, the radicalization of uh, Hamas. You cannot do that without Israeli control in Gaza for a certain period of time, like the Allies did in the end of the Second World War. If you want to do a Marshall Plan, you need to be there. Um, and I think this is something that the army is finding hard to accept. They don't really want to control things in Gaza, but I think they don't have a choice. We cannot reach the goals of war without it. We can maybe eradicate Hamas as a military entity, but governmental, we need to replace them. And then see how we build a local leadership in Gaza. And it will take time. There is no one day after. It's a process. How many days after? The first one is Israeli control. Second one, we'll see what will happen. It's a process. In the north, I think that the day after is IDF in South Lebanon. Hezbollah hit severely and our citizens back home and rebuilding their lives uh, in the north. And Iran, the day after, is a coalition at, um, either putting a credible military threat or attacking Iran. Um, we cannot have a nuclear Iran. I mean, Israel, at the end of the day, if the world is not going to take it seriously, Israel will take it seriously and deal with this. But I think that Iran needs to be dealt with a coalition. And I think that when talking about the willingness of Saudi Arabia, the Sunni world, to normalize relations, they signed the Abraham Accords because of the strength of Israel, not weakness. So if we want peace agreements, Israel needs to be strong. It will be peace through strength, not through appeasement. And um, therefore, it's very, very important for Israel to win decisively. And this is what I, why I say that the bigger the win will be, the more decisive it will be, it will bring peace agreements. It will create a coalition. In the Middle East, what will this coalition do? I hope they will deal with Iran 
and stop their aggression and all its proxies and um, stop their uh, nuclear plans, which we cannot, uh, which we cannot really afford. Um, we are going to hear from some of our experts, which are really, really experts in the area of the civil area of how you deal with dealing with the Gaza from the civil point of view. From, I, I will say shortly what is the military terms needed in the day after to make sure that never again there will be a terror army in Gaza. Now, to understand what we need militarily, we need a short history lesson. Between 67, when Israel uh, conquered uh, Gaza to 94 to Oslo, Gaza was pretty much a non-issue. They were at the Stone Age. Israelis used to shop in Gaza, used to go to the beach in Gaza, Gazans used to work in Israel. We had coexistence. Um, but then came Oslo in 94. And in 94 we handed uh, the cities of Gaza to the Palestinian Authority, to the PLO, which is a vicious terror organization. And we didn't pull out of Philadelphia. We didn't take out any of our towns inside Gaza. We just gave them control of the cities and gave them weapons to enforce that control. The result of this, and, uh, and due to the decision of Israel not to operate inside the cities at all, because this was Area A, this is the Palestinian Authority. The same Palestinian Authority took Gaza in seven years from the Stone Age, literally, to shooting rockets. Think about it. Just by the fact that Israel didn't operate in these cities, as we do every day in Judea and Samaria and the West Bank, they managed to build themselves, and this is the Palestinian Authority, not Hamas, from Stone Age to rockets. First rocket shot on Israel in 2001. This is four years before the disengagement. In 2004, 10 years after Oslo, Israel completely lost control of the Gaza Strip, completely. We went from a private car being able to drive in the center of Gaza to armored brigades, APCs, UAVs, snipers, mortars, artillery, fighting a huge terror army inside Gaza, endless amount of operations and attacks. And when we reached the point in 2005 where the decision was either conquering all of Gaza, which was the right decision to do, or what Sharon decided to pull out 8,000 Israelis from Gaza and basically send a message, we surrender, um, it was due to the complete loss of control. And this is, again, in a reality where our towns were inside Gaza, we controlled Philadelphia Corridor, and still we had loss of control just by not operating in the cities. When we pulled out of Philadelphia and connected Gaza to Egypt, what this did, this, already there was loss of control, but once we connected Gaza to Egypt, endless amount of weapons, of capabilities, of technologies, of manpower streamed into Gaza, and this process became exponential. So it's very easy to understand what we need to do to reverse this. We need to control Philadelphia and stop the exponentiality of buildup of power, but we also need full freedom of operation in the cities to prevent the buildup of forces as they did in the time of Oslo. And there is something that to me is much more tactical, not strategic, it's the perimeter. The Southern Command is building a one kilometer perimeter inside Gaza that nobody can cross. So before it was 300 meters, then the, even these 300 meters were not enforced. Now they're doing a kilometer. But this is very, very tactical because if you control Philadelphia and you have freedom of operation in the cities, this perimeter is not that important because you make sure that there is no buildup of uh, terror capabilities inside. So it doesn't matter really, it's not that important. It's important, but not crucial. 
What is crucial is freedom of operation in the cities and controlling Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, since we took control of Philadelphia, we found around 20 huge, huge tunnels. Now I'm telling you somebody who commanded the Egyptian border. I commanded most of the Egyptian border for two years. You cannot build an infrastructure like that. Huge cars are driving inside these tunnels without full cooperation of Egypt. It cannot be done. And we have to realize that only Israel can really secure the border. Um, this enterprise of things being moved from the Sinai Peninsula to Gaza, it's a billions, billions of dollars enterprise. It's a lot of money involved. When there's a lot of money, there is bribery, and people are getting paid. Um, so we really need to control this uh, this border. From the civil point of view, I won't, I won't get into it. I, 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 to really the details, I'll let my colleagues talk about it. But I want to emphasize one thing that the government is saying, and I think the Israeli society supports overwhelmingly. The day after, in Gaza, there will be no Hamas, no Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and also not the Palestinian Authority. So obviously, if it's not all these organizations, we need a new solution. And then if the government of Israel is saying clearly that the Palestinian Authority is not an option, the next question will be, so why are they an option in, the, in Judah and Samaria? If they are so bad, and they are bad, why are we agreeing to their existence uh, in the West Bank? And this is something that I think once we implement a different solution in Gaza, this question will raise and people will ask, okay, so if you have another solution from Gaza, why don't you implement it also in, the, in Judah and Samaria? And um, I think that even in this sense, looking at um, who are going to be the leaders in the Palestinian society in the future and taking in account that 95% of the Palestinians in the West Bank oppose the Palestinian Authority, I think that we are in a period of time that will see big changes also in the Palestinian uh, society. Some of them have to do with inner issues inside the Palestinian society, and some of them have to do with the war and the work that Israel is doing now to eradicate uh, Hamas and the uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and also the intensive operations we see also in the West Bank, not just in, uh, not just in Gaza. And obviously, when we finish with Gaza and the North, the operations in the West Bank will intensify dramatically. Now we are operating with what we can, with the amount of forces we have, but uh, because we are more focused on the South and the North. But there will be a moment in the future where this will change. And we will be more focused on what's going on uh, in the West Bank. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to, to answer questions uh, before we move to the next speaker. Thank you, everyone, for joining our briefing today. Again, that was Brigadier General Amir Avidi speaking to a delegation from Europe. Uh, after he spoke, we had a number of other speakers uh, discussing some of those related issues. And I think that history that he gave of Gaza really gives a strong background and understanding of what we are up to today and um, how not to repeat the same mistakes in the past. Um, the response from the group was tremendous. Uh, we do these types of briefings regularly because delegations come, they appreciate the knowledge that we share, and they um, help us bring additional delegations over, policymakers, all types of people who hopefully will go back to their respective countries uh, and uh, build the cooperation even more. So thank you to all of our viewers, all of our supporters for tuning into this briefing. We will be back with you next week, Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. here in Israel. Until then, stay safe, stay strong. Take care, everyone.